Well, this is one of my favorite images to show you in this class. What you're looking at here are a bunch of objects that are in orbit around Earth. So in this lesson, we're talking about satellite meteorology. Well, according to like NORAD and the US Space Surveillance Agency and NASA, we think that there's somewhere between 20,000 and 30,000 different objects in orbit around Earth. And Earth is the ball that's right there in the middle. Now, each one of these dots kind of represents one of those objects. And it's kind of fun to think about. I remember back when I was a kid hearing about while they were building like a satellite or the International Space Station or something like that, that, um, that one of the astronauts accidentally let go of a hand I think the hammer costs like 30,000 bucks or something silly like that. And it's now just up there in orbit around Earth. And they're tracking it, keeping a close eye on it as it orbits Earth, uh, kind of held in place by its gravity. But we're not talking about hammers today. What we're talking about are satellites. And generally, when you look at this image, I want you to kind of key in on a couple of patterns here. Can you see how there's a bunch of satellites that are clustered right here around Earth? A bunch of objects, I should say, that are clustered right around Earth. We have a bunch of things in here, a bunch of satellites that are in what we call a low Earth orbit or polar orbit. We also have a bunch that are out here in what we call a geostationary orbit that's orbiting way out here like this. Now, before you get any kind of crazy ideas about this image, I want to let you know something. It looks as though that if you were to jump in a spaceship and take a a ride out into outer space that it would be difficult to, to leave the planet because of all the junk that's in the way. Well, each one of the dots, the little icons you see here representing an object in orbit around Earth, those dots are enormous compared to the size. And I just make a point here. Whenever we launch stuff into outer space, we try to make it as small as possible. For example, when NASA designs a new satellite, they want to keep their payload as light as possible because half of the budget is often just spent on getting the object into outer space, getting the satellite up there. So if they have a $2 billion budget, a billion of it might be spent on the launch vehicle and the fuel. So we try to keep this stuff small. One other thing to think about, see this tilt here in the ring that kind of goes around Earth here of all these objects in orbit around Earth? Well, that tilt is, is basically uh, matching the 23 and a half degree tilt that Earth has on its axis because the satellites are out here in this orbit um, are basically looking down on the equator of the Earth. So it's kind of neat to see that. So with that as our backdrop, let's talk about satellites. And I'm going to talk about them specifically with their ability to kind of detect all different types of severe weather. So let me ask you this question. One of the primary goals in launching meteorological satellites was to observe this type of weather event. Which is it? Was it hurricanes? Was it tornadoes, blizzards, floods, or drought? And what do you think it was? While you're thinking, see that image that's down there on the bottom right? That image shows you the GOES-R project. Now, we've launched two satellites as a part of this project in 2016 and 17. Uh, sorry, 17 and 18. And those satellites were GOES-16 and GOES-17. That's what we named them. Now, that G in GOES stands for geostationary. That means these satellites are about 36,000 kilometers away from Earth, staring down at Earth, taking what is now some very high-resolution images. When we launched these back in 1975, okay, so mid-70s, one of the primary targets was hurricanes. We wanted to see hurricanes, and here's the reason why. Check out this animation, 2008, Hurricane Ike. We'll talk about Hurricane Ike a lot in this class because it was a very interesting case study. Hurricane Ike out here churning over parts of the Bahamas going toward Cuba, powerful hurricane. Hurricane Ike in 2008 followed a very similar hurricane track from the year 1900, a hurricane called the Galveston Hurricane. Got that name because it hit Galveston, Texas, which is just outside of Houston right here. Now, the Galveston Hurricane in 1900 was the United States, up to this point, most deadly landfalling hurricane, killing 8,000 people. Well, why did it do that? Well, unlike present day, we didn't have satellite observations. All we had was ship reports or weather station reports or people out observing the clouds trying to understand if the weather was changing such that a big hurricane was coming. And therefore, warning times were very, very short and people weren't able to evacuate. And when the Galveston hurricane, following the exact track you just saw there that Hurricane Ike did, made landfall, it killed 100, I'm sorry, try that again, 8,000 people. Hurricane Ike in 2008, well, we observed it many, many days before it made landfall. We watched its every move. We measured its winds from space. We captured images every 15 minutes of its evolving cloud field. From that, we could put that data into the best weather forecasting models to project Ike's path. 
and it was remarkable. Days ahead of landfall there near Houston, Texas, we knew that Ike had a high probability of hitting Houston and Galveston. We got people out of harm's way. And as a result, only 113 deaths in the United States from Hurricane Ike. Still, $40 billion in damages. But the launching of geostationary satellites in the mid-1970s has changed, has revolutionized our ability to monitor and predict hurricane behavior. So keep that in the back of your mind through the rest of all my lectures this semester. Let's come back to another view of the image of these satellites in space. So this is now looking at satellites only. It's pretty amazing, but we're going to talk again about orbital configurations, talking about the ones that are very close to Earth called the low Earth orbiting satellites and the ones that are far away called the geostationary satellites. And just a little bit different view of it from the previous image I showed you. All right. Very first ever, quote, television picture from space came from a satellite called Tiros-1. It captured that image on April Fool's Day of 1960. I often wonder if people thought it was a joke. Well, anyways, when it took this picture, pretty low quality picture here, you can see uh, this is basically Eastern Canada. So Newfoundland, Nova Scotia, that region right over through here. And here's the Atlantic Ocean. This is a big blob of clouds. Now, since then, our satellite technology has improved quite a bit. I'm going to take you to a previous generation image of our geostationary satellites. This is Hurricane Danielle, and uh, we're looking at a, a visible satellite image from GOES-13. GOES-13 was replaced with GOES-16 recently. Now, when you look at this, it looks like there's an incredible amount of detail, but I'll let you know something. The resolution of this satellite is pretty poor because it's 36,000 kilometers away from Earth. That's about 22 and a half thousand miles away from Earth. When it looks down at Earth, well, pixel size, which is what I mean when I talk about resolution here, is pretty big. Each pixel uh, across one kilometer. Now, you can see a lot of definition, a lot of detail, but this is pretty low resolution. Some of our highest resolution satellites we have right now, well, they have resolution down to the centimeter. That's right, from space, the resolution of some of our best meteorological satellites, one centimeter. And I'll tell you something, the government and its spy satellite uh, capability, uh, well, if we track it throughout history, they've always been about two orders of magnitude better in resolution than we have in the meteorological community, which means they are able to see even finer resolution things from space. Now, Hurricane Danielle, I got a question for you about this. What time was it locally? Okay, what time was it locally? It says that it was 11.45 UTC, that's 11.45 GMT or 11.45 uh, Z time on the 27th of August, 2010. Now that is during daylight saving time, which means we got to subtract five hours from this. This image was captured locally, the local time in Champaign, Illinois, where I record my videos at 6.45 AM. All right, but out over the open Atlantic, it was uh, mid morning. And this was just after the sun had really risen there, and you can see some spectacular detail. Now, let's talk about this geostationary orbit. I love this animation that we got here. You see, we're looking at five different geostationary satellites. There's a whole bunch more than just these five. But as the Earth rotates, the orbital period of the satellite matches the rotation of the Earth. And that allows these satellites to look down on Earth and always stare at the same spot. What's the advantage? Well, if they keep taking images at the same spot because their orbital period matches the rotation of the Earth, well, they can capture kind of time-lapse views of weather systems. And that's their biggest advantage. Well, that, and at that distance, they can also see a pretty big chunk of the Earth at any given time. So, those are called our geosynchronous or geostationary satellites. They're primarily used for weather observation, okay? But they're pretty low resolution, but the big advantage is they look down at the same point on the equator at the same longitude, and they can see nearly half of the Earth. They can get a picture, well, at least the new ones can, every single minute. But remember, their orbital period matches the rotation of the Earth, and that's why you see in that animation at the bottom, the satellite's basically going around Earth at the same speed, okay? Our low Earth orbiting or polar orbiting satellites are our primary research satellites. Advantages, they're much closer to the Earth, they orbit from pole to pole, and the Earth spins underneath them, and therefore, because they're so much closer, they can capture some pretty high resolution imagery. Our standard meteorological satellites, they get between 250 meters and down to 50 meter resolution. We do have some that are at one meter and some that are sub-meter as well, but generally we find them between 250 meter and 15 meter. 
Now to kind of show you what this looks like, this is one of the satellites designed by one of our faculty here at the University of Illinois, Professor Larry DiGirolamo. And his satellite looks down at Earth at nine different viewpoints. And the satellite is called MISER, and it sits on a platform called EOS Terra. Now what you see here is that as MISER orbits Earth and the Earth spins underneath it, it only is able to trace out a small little swath of Earth's uh, cloud systems and surface at any given time. It crisscrosses there at the North Pole and the South Pole. But because it's so much closer, yeah, we get high resolution images, but we don't get to see very much. So again, the idea here is rather than orbiting the Earth like you see here, such that we match uh, Earth's rotation, this one goes pole to pole and lets the Earth spin underneath it. Now, given that, let's talk about the advantages of each. This is an image from MODIS. That's another satellite on board of EOS Terra. It snapped this image, which is a true color RGB image of Southern California. So right here is Los Angeles. This was on a day back in October 2007 where we had Santa Ana winds that kicked up some massive fires. And the fires, as you can see here, blowing across, um, you know, across Southern California, really reduced air quality, major, major threat to life and property. Here's the issue, though. While we got this incredible high-resolution image of the smoke, I mean, gosh, you can see so much detail here. Well, MODIS was on its way north. Five minutes after this, it was taking pictures somewhere up in Washington. Five minutes after that, it was up in Canada. It's just really screaming as it moves from pole to pole. So we get a high resolution picture, but we can't make a movie out of it. Well, when this was also happening, our geostationary satellites were taking images as well. And this is what they captured. Now, this is much, much, much lower resolution imagery. But what we can see here as we watch this is we can see a whole lot better time resolution. You know, what we're really getting a good a picture here is what the smoke plumes look like with time. So while it's not perfect, I mean, really, we even see some instrument drift here because the satellite's so far away, we can at least watch the fires evolve with time. So very, very useful, each in their own right. Now let's talk about the channels, the channels that we have on our satellites. We're really going to focus on two in Atmos 120. We're going to talk about visible satellite imagery first, and then after that we're going to talk about thermal infrared imagery. Well, the visible satellite imagery is easiest, I think, to understand, and that's because you're just measuring with the satellite reflected sunlight. Basically, there's a multi-million dollar digital camera on the satellite, just like this one that you see up here. But as it stares down at Earth at very high resolution, it's able to capture light that's bouncing off of Earth that was originally sourced from the sun. So features on a visible satellite image are distinguished by albedo. And albedo is just a, a ratio. It's a ratio of reflected sunlight over incident sunlight. So bright objects have high albedo, dark objects have low albedo. Now where we're sampling is right here in the visible port portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. There's an atmospheric window there. In other words, there's no gaseous absorption. In other words, you can see things because the light that the sun produces, the visible light, isn't absorbed by oxygen, nitrogen, uh, carbon dioxide, water vapor, argon, none of that. So the atmosphere is transparent to that light. Now, when you're trying to interpret these images, it's very, very simple. It's basically what your eyes are able to see. So, bright objects are just objects with high albedo, like um, snow, thick clouds, ice caps, dark objects, vegetation, land, thin clouds we can see right through, and the oceans. So basically, it's whatever your eyes see. Now, the problem is we can't use visible satellite imagery at night. So for example, see the two images you see down here? Well, this line that you see right here isn't where the satellite's broken. You're just seeing nighttime over here. Daytime is where the sun is rising right in that location. So no images at night. That's a major kind of restriction on visible satellite imagery. But during the day, it captures some extremely, extremely high resolution stuff. Now let me show you what some of this stuff looks like here because this is incredible. This is an animation of a hurricane. And this particular hurricane here back in 2017, powerful expression of weather. We caught an image of this every minute from our geostationary satellites, GO-16 in this case. Isn't that incredible what we can see from space with our visible satellite imagery? Here's another example. These are some thunderstorms blowing up in Colorado, Kansas, Oklahoma, Texas, and parts of New Mexico. Incredible to see what these things look like as they blow up throughout the day. This is our brand new geostationary satellite data. Instead of being one kilometer resolution, it's 500 meters, and it can take an image every minute. 
I'll be honest with you, when these data came out, I watched these videos for hours on end just because it's so fascinating to see weather like this from space. Let me give you another example. Here were some fires at the beginning of 2018, really in June 2018 in the desert southwestern part of the United States. Look at how we can see the smoke plume so clearly from outer space. Or here's some thunderstorms blowing up in the Midwest right on this line, this frontal boundary. Look at it just bubble and roil throughout the atmosphere, boil. It's just, it's just amazing to see this. This is what our new geostationary satellites can capture. Just wanted to show you that. And then this was one of my favorites. This was from uh, June uh, 1st, uh, 2018. Now watch this animation. Isn't that amazing? This is a backdoor cold front supported by Lake Michigan that swept all the way through northern Indiana, northern Illinois, parts of Wisconsin, and Michigan. Watch it again. Gosh, it's just so neat to see. Look at it clearing out all the air. Look at the thunderstorms blow up ahead of it. Just amazing to see this stuff from space. Our old satellites couldn't do this. The new ones can. Now, I kind of lied to you a little bit. We can actually see stuff at night. But remember, we're not measuring in, uh, um, we're not measuring here emitted thermal light. We're measuring light emitted by, well, street lights, building lights, lights from our homes. This image is called Earth at night. And we're seeing the visible lights emitted from Earth's cities. Incredible to see that. Let's zoom in on the United States. You can see all the major metropolitan areas. Look, uh, New York City, Baltimore, Washington, D.C., Boston, these big cities out here in the east. Uh, you can see Atlanta. You can see Chicago, Detroit, Milwaukee. There's Minneapolis. You know, here's Dallas, Fort Worth, Houston, Texas, St. Louis, Missouri. Big, big, big cities here. But as you go out west, notice how we don't see so much. Well, our population density is pretty low out west. But also, you're kind of fooled a little bit when you look at this map and, and think you're seeing cities. For example, this is in North Dakota. And you see that little region right there? That is not a major metropolitan area. This is actually a huge oil field where they're flaring off or burning natural gas. So we're actually seeing the natural gas flares right through there. Amazing to see that. South America, look at the Amazon. Very, very dark. Not a lot of people live here. But look at Brazil. Huge population centers along uh, the Atlantic coast there. Let's go to another one, Europe. Real estate along the Mediterranean must be expensive. Look at all the people that like to line, you know, here's Italy. Look at all the people that like to line the Mediterranean coast. You can see Germany, London. Um, you can come over here. There's Moscow. You know, look at this. Or oh, my favorite, the Nile River. Look at all the people that live along the Nile River. Amazing to see that. Let me show you India. You know, this is going to be one part of the world that as India continues to industrialize and modernize and grow, it's going to get brighter and brighter and brighter. Amazing to see all of the major city centers of a country that has a population here, well over a billion people. And finally, I want to show you this one. This is Southeast Asia and China. Now, you're looking at lights here from well over a billion and a half people. But I want to point out one simple thing. Look at this. This is South Korea, and that is North Korea. Pyongyang is right there. Amazing to see the differences here on the Korean Peninsula. So we can see some stuff at night, but it's got to be light from our city lights from outer space. But this is pretty cool. Now, I want to show you these images. I have a thermal infrared camera, and I took a picture of my normal classes. So this is one I teach in Lincoln Hall Theater at the University of Illinois. And this is what my students look like in the thermal infrared. Instead of now seeing visible light bouncing off their skin from the lights in the room or the lights outside, I'm now looking at the heat emitted by them. So if the visible satellite imagery looks at light that comes from another source that bounces off an object, like the sun producing light and bouncing off the Earth's surface or clouds, and therefore we can see it with our satellites, now we're looking at emitted radiation. In fact, it's interesting. I can actually use my little thermal infrared camera to see if people are sick. You can measure their temperatures. Or can you see this guy right here, or this person, I don't know if it's a guy or a girl, wearing glasses. So is this person. No, look, you can see the, how cooler it is around their faces. Uh, let's look at some other things. This is my hand. I put my hand down on a desk. You can clearly see it on the left image. I then pick my hand up, and look, you can still see the heat signature of my hand on the desk. And it's also neat. See my wedding ring? You can actually see how it's cooler than the rest of my skin. Now, what's interesting about this is that my skin basically heated up the table, made the molecules vibrate faster, and they emitted 
thermal infrared light that the camera picked up on. Speaking of hands, I had a former student with what's called Raynaud's disease. My hand is underneath and her hand is over the top. Whereas my skin temperature was way up in the 80s, even in the lower 90s, she has a problem with circulation out toward the end of her fingers. And look at how cold they are. Her fingertips were in the 60s and she just constantly has cold hands. Very interesting to see that. Now, just the other day, I decided to take a picture of my lunch. So I had some chips, a sandwich, and some grapes. But when you look at this image, you can barely see down here, I have a cold pack keeping my lunch cold. Here's what it looks like when I look at it in the thermal infrared. Being a cold object, it measured a very, very cold temperature. And in fact, my, I kept my grapes somewhere around, I don't know, about 40 degrees. And I kept my cold pack was still below freezing, therefore it's down here around 30. Pretty amazing to see that. I took a picture of my desk. Uh, you can see I had two computers uh, at my desk. You can also see where I was sitting. See, my, my bottom warmed up the, the seat of my chair. Uh, you can also see my keyboard was cool, but all around it, things were relatively warm. Maybe where I was putting my hands or laying my arms. Uh, and you can see my computer monitor is quite warm as well. Neat to be able to see that. Um, here's another neat thing. I took a picture with my camera on my cell phone looking out at Harker Hall across uh, right outside my window from Natural History Building. I can see right through it. Check this out though. In the thermal infrared, glass is reflective. So I was waving at the time I took this picture holding my thermal infrared camera. So that's the, my body heat bouncing off of the glass. So that's really kind of interesting. Turns out this is why greenhouses are so effective. They let visible light in, but they reflect thermal infrared, keeping the greenhouse warm. Plus they trap in the heat. Kind of need to think about that. Check this out. There I am holding up with a stupid smirk on my face, a glass pane over there on the right. My colleague, Professor Jeff Frame, took my picture. And what's interesting is, you can't see through glass in the thermal infrared. So if you wanted to hide from government spy satellites uh, that use thermal infrared technology, you could hide from them in a glass house. They wouldn't be able to see you because of the reflective properties and the absorption properties of glass. And one last picture Professor Frame took of me. Well, here it is kind of zoomed in on my, on my shorts, uh, here in my midsection. If you looked over the image on the right first, you may not have any idea that I put my lunch pack ice pack right there in my pocket. But in the uh, thermal infrared, it's obvious that it's sitting in there. Very, very uh, warm. In fact, what's also neat is look how hot my face is, but my nose is rather cold, have no idea why. My neck is quite warm. So are my, uh, like the bend in my arm here. Kind of need to see that. I'll be honest, it's a good thing that we don't have thermal infrared eyes because if we did, we would recognize each other in very, very different ways. Uh, we would recognize our heat signatures. In fact, we might wear clothing differently so it like maybe writes my name right here across my shirt so that you know I'm Eric because you won't be able to see my face very clearly because you kind of lose a lot of you know the, the, the resolution because we're looking in the thermal infrared. So just some kind of neat things to think about. Now, with that, I want to show you this video, and this video is all over the internet, and I can find it in about 50 different places, so I'm going to show it to you. It's called The Infrared Fart. Yeah. Okay. Now, when I watched this video the first time, I was cracking up, okay? But in an instant, I knew that it was totally fake. First of all, if this guy were to fart that much air, we would actually see his stomach deflate. That's a, that's a huge fart. But we know it's not real because, and we all fart, okay? We know that when you pass gas, it's warm. It's your body temperature. Yet this is cold, and we don't fart cold. I decided to recreate this scene, and this is what I did. So there I am in the infrared, and here I have, okay, a can of air in my left hand. I've turned it upside down, a can of compressed air, and I'm squeezing it and it's blowing out really, really cold air. I think this is all that the guy did when that video was made of the infrared fart. All right, what are we doing with all of this? Well, this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna put uh, sensors like this uh, on, our, uh, on our satellites. Now, an image like this, this is some of my students here. I want you to think about this. In this image, when you look up here, remember that these instruments are measuring emitted 
infrared, infrared radiation. That's radiation with a wavelength of like 10, 11, 12 micrometers. That's pretty long. Your eyes can't see that. Only this instrument can. And it's measuring the temperature. Now, this kid sitting down here in the front is warm. This guy just came in from outside. Look, his jacket was cold. I can also see where students were sitting. Uh, there was a student sitting here, but not there. I can see their heat signature on the, on the seats. So if we're going to measure emitted uh, radiation, we have to think about this differently. Now, remember this. Stuff that is up high in the sky is cold. Stuff that's near the ground is warm. What's confusing about this is that every time we show you an infrared image, we've inverted the color scale. Now, what are we talking about here? Well, we do this because cold objects are dark when we look at them in an original uh, infrared image, and warm objects are bright, like the image you see right up here in the top panel. But if you were to if I were to ask you, let's say it this way, if I were to ask you to define what a cloud looks like, you would use words like bright and white and fluffy, like cotton. Our brains think clouds are bright white objects. So because they're cold, they look like they're dark from outer space when looking at infrared, where the surface is warm and therefore bright. So we invert every satellite image that's in the infrared. Now, if that was confusing, just remember this. All satellite, uh, radar, sorry, satellite infrared images are inverted. Therefore, and take this note down with me, bright objects are cold objects. Cold objects are high objects, like the tops of thunderstorms or high thin cirrus clouds. Those are the ones that are real wispy and they stick up way there in the top of the troposphere. Dark objects are warm objects. They are low. They're near the surface. Turns out even snow appears dark on an infrared image. You may think snow is cold, but it's not nearly as cold as the tops of thunderstorms. So remember this, bright, cold, high, dark, warm, low. Sometimes we even go an extra step and apply a color coding to this. So you see down here, this is the temperatures. And once we get colder than minus 20, we put this color coding on here. So even though this looks like warm colors, it's just the kind of rainbow-like color uh, code we put down here. This is actually really, really cold cloud tops of Hurricane Katrina. Now, to get some practice with this, check out this animation here. This was Hurricane Irma from 2017. This is an infrared satellite image. And when you're looking at this, what we're seeing here are the very, very cold cloud tops with a color scale applied to it so it's easy to discern. So over here, we're looking all the way down to the ocean surface and it's warm. Here, we're looking at the cold cloud tops with the color coding applied to the infrared image. Give you another example here. These are sea surface temperatures. We can clearly see throughout the year how sea surface temperatures change. So here's summer and fall, getting back into winter and spring. You can even see the Gulf Stream and the loop current. This is some of the stuff we can measure with our infrared satellites. Now, here's a visible satellite image of a typhoon in the Western Pacific Ocean. Now, visible over to infrared. Now, the benefit, I can see the infrared stuff at night. I can also measure the temperatures of the cloud tops. Really neat to be able to see this. And you can also see these big storms popping up around the edge of this powerful, powerful typhoon. Really amazing to see this imagery here. Check this out. As Super Typhoon Maranti went right over the top of this island, the island was in the eye. Now look, in the eye, where in the grayscale here, these are warmer and warmer temperatures. Around it, where the color coding is applied, these cloud type temperatures were down to about 190, maybe 200 Kelvin. That's extremely cold upper level cloud top temperatures. Amazing to see that. And just to show you both of them kind of played together here, this is an animation, whoops, sorry. This is an animation of a visible satellite image on top and an infrared satellite image on the bottom. We only get the visible satellite imagery, which is spectacular, by the way, during the day. Watch this, sun's gonna set, and as it sets, we're gonna lose our visible satellite imagery. But our infrared imagery just keeps going here. So here comes the sunset, shuts everything down with the visible, but we could keep watching all night long with our infrared imagery. So that's some of the primary uses. Now back to that picture. This is a spectacular picture here of San Francisco Bay. And you, San Francisco is pretty famous for its fogs that roll in. So I have a question for you. What do you think these clouds look like on a visible satellite image? Well, now this image was taken early in the morning, so the sun was just barely up, but we could still see it from space. 
Notice how reflective the clouds are. Because they bounce the sunlight so easily, they're a thick cloud, these will appear very bright on a visible satellite image. But what about an infrared satellite image? Well, they are low, close to the ocean, and therefore because they're low, they are warm and dark. Here's proof. This is a visible satellite image. This is an infrared satellite image. When you look at this, you can see the clouds right in through here. And these clouds are very thick and bright. And therefore, as they move right into San Francisco, they're really easy to see. But we can't see them on the infrared. And the reason we can't see them here is because they're low and dark and warm. And their temperature is not much different from the temperature of the surrounding ocean. You can barely see the surrounding ocean right here. Very difficult to detect these clouds because, in infrared because they're so warm. They're not much of a distinguishing uh, temperature from the background ocean. Um, get some more practice. What do you think this would look like on an infrared satellite? Clearly on the visible, it's going to be very, very bright. But this is a massive cumulonimbus cloud. Up here at the top, these cloud type temperatures may be minus 40, may be minus 50, minus 60 degrees. Because they're so high, they are definitely going to be cold and therefore bright on the infrared satellite imagery. So this is just some practice with using this stuff. And as we kind of finish up here, I want to show you some pretty spectacular imagery. These are what the cloud tops look like of a storm like this. So on top, visible imagery looks just like this. But in the infrared, these storms look something more like this. Now we're measuring their temperature. And these are the very, very cold cloud tops of massive complexes of thunderstorms over Texas. So with that, we now learned about these two different types of imagery and their orbital configurations. And those are the main points to take away from this lecture on satellites.